Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I, uh, I was uh, dragged off the golf course for this uh, feckin' do here tonight <laughs> by the amnesty crowd. And uh, of course, the first question I want to know is, what's it all about, Chief? Because I'm a businessman, and bottom line is the most important thing to me. So they said it's a... Uh, the issues here are torture, imprisonment, and capital punishment. And so it is with great pleasure I'm here tonight because there's nothing dearer and closer to my heart <laughs> than torture, imprisonment, and capital punishment. And we need a lot more of it. <laughs> now, uh, <laughs> this is my wife, you know, she's a terrible woman anyhow. Uh, she says to me that listening to me is torture. <laughs> Oh, yeah, they can say with the light nowadays because they have the old equality, you know what I mean? That's a good thing, don't get me wrong. I think women should have a certain amount of equality, you know. <laughs> About 30% there, about a <laughs> But uh, my secretary, Deirdre, she's a gas ticket, and uh, she's always going on about, you know, the pains only a woman can experience, you know, ooh, period pains and all that. And I, I said to her, come here to me, come here to me, love. I said, you know, <laughs> love, I said, because it wasn't the sexual harassment week. So I said to her, <laughs> I, you know, she, I said to her, listen, you, if you want to know what real pain is, it's the unique pain only a man can experience, a kick in the bollocks. <laughs> and she says to me, quick as a flash, she says, and do you get a kick in the bollocks every month? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but they'll answer you back to women nowadays. Jeez, you could, I was going to fire her, but then I realised she'd probably get me under unfair dismissals because she was obviously, you know, PMT, you know, that's... Oh, you, you go mad or, you know, don't they, when they're like that, women usually they throw things out the window and set fire to the office and everything like that, you know. That all started with your woman, you know, Emily, what's her name, threw herself under a horse at Epsom. Now, that was PMT, obviously. Mad second thing to do, throw herself under a horse. And completely irresponsible, those horses cost a fortune. And you know, that's, she, the reason she probably did that was to avoid period pain, simple as that. Now, Queen, Queen Victoria, I have to read this somewhere, she, she took cannabis to avoid period pains. This is absolutely true. It's a, a historical fact. And uh, I know a bit about the old cannabis. My eldest lad uh, actually gave me a joint the other day. Though when I say joint, I, I am not talking about a leg of lamb here. Are we with me, right? <laughs> but anyway, the eldest lad, he came, uh, he came home anyhow, and he, he, said, he brought a young, young lassie with him, you know. And I, I, I must say, it's, it's gas to see your own kid bringing a girlfriend home, you know. And she's a beautiful thing now, blonde hair, little bum, and, you know, the bra and everything, you know. <laughs> I noticed things like that, you know, there was a mash in that. And so I, I stood there staring for a while and he said, Dad, you know, and so I went anyhow after a while. You know, I told you, young people, leave them alone. So I couldn't stop thinking about him downstairs, the young lassie, you know. So I went upstairs anyhow and I had, uh, had uh, a wank. So I tried the joint, I tried the joint anyhow, and the first one didn't go down, very terrible heartburn. And apparently you're supposed to smoke the feckin' thing. So geez, I just, one bite and down it went, you know. So I tried a second joint, I smoked this one, did nothing for me. What? So, ever. So I said, I'm feck this, I'm going out for a bite to eat in the kitchen. So I went in and I had um, three or four bowls of Cocoa Pops and uh, I found a cold rasher and there was a mustard sandwich and some chocolate digestives, which I put a lovely duck pate on. It was very nice. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, torture, imprisonment, capital punishment. Here's to it. I was born in Tyrone, 1956, for something I didn't do. <laughs> I was innocent, but they gave me life. <laughs> I, I still remember the midwife who extradited me. She, um, she dragged me out of the womb and she said, there you go, Mrs. McAleer, you've got a wee comedian. <laughs> I was laughing my head off. <laughs> but my mother, she was present at the birth. <laughs> oh, she insisted on it. <laughs> Wild horses wouldn't drag her away. <clears throat> Although they did offer her that option as well. <laughs> But no, I, I developed my sense of humor very early, early on. I was, I was only three when I set fire to the cat. <laughs> my mother said it wasn't funny, but um, 
I knew it would get a laugh one day. <laughs> Been a long time coming, but um, <laughs> it, it was worth the wait. And it's brilliant because my mum rings me, right? It's brilliant when your mum rings you at my age because it's like she treats you like a kid again and it's somebody who loves you unreservedly no matter what. And my mum's on the phone going, Kevin, has it gone cold in England? Have you enough blankets on your bed? Are you sure? I'm going, I'm sure, mum, shut up, will you? Shut up. Kevin, are you getting enough sleep? Have you enough beds? Are you sure? I'm going, I'm sure, mum, shut up, yeah, leave me alone, I'm an adult. Shh. Kevin, have you enough teapots, ostrich feathers, murals, ceilings, walls, halls, video channels? I'm going, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure. I get off the phone with a lovely, warm, loved feeling inside. Go into the centre of London where I live. Nobody gives a shit whether I live or die. Except the people who live in the streets. They always come in to say, have you enough money for a cup of tea? Are you sure? <laughs> it's not lovely. So, five pubs go into a bloke and it hurt. But the... <laughs> Now, I was walking down. It's funny. A funny thing happened on the way to the theatre. Uh, somebody said hello, and it, it, um, you know, because people are very unfriendly. They, and people don't actually. I'm going to finish the sentence. I can feel it. But people don't actually. <laughs> people don't talk to you much nowadays, do they? You know, when people say um, uh, hello, that's apparently your parents always say, oh, you know, things used to happen. P people used to say hello, and you, do, you could leave your door open, and you know, sometimes your windows, and not even have a house, and you wouldn't get robbed. But the. <laughs> Because you didn't have anything anyway, and you didn't exist. But the, um, <laughs> nowadays, ah, oh, it's all all this security, and you have to wear a moustache to get anything done. And the, <laughs> but um, and like, what are we going to tell our kids? You know, ah, oh, you should have been around when we were alive. It was fantastic. AIDS, war, it was brilliant. You should have been there. It was. <laughs> what do you have now? Nothing except you're, you don't even have a head. You have to make it yourself every morning. And. Um, I have no idea what I'm talking about, but I am right. No, <laughs> None of your people getting married, they're having kids as well. Don't have kids, it's your parents' revenge on you. Your parents don't care what you're doing, if you're single attached, whatever, as long as you have kids. Case in point, my brother has a kid. Two months ago, he gave an emergency call to my mother. He hadn't slept in two days. He was at his wit's end. My mother gave a call to me and said, it's Connor and Jean, they're in trouble. Come out and help. Went out to the house, he opened the door. I've never seen my brother look like this. I've seen him when I, with a hangover. I've seen him with his head in the toilet. I've never seen this. He opened the door, he, his face was that pale ashen green color and he's going, ha, 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 ha. Well, we don't know what it is. Um, every time we pick her up, she just starts crying and, uh, and she won't go to sleep. She sleeps for 10 minutes and uh, we feed her and we change. We don't know what to do. And my mother's there going, oh yeah, that's terrible. Oh, yeah. But there's a little glint in her eye. I know that on the inside, she's going, <laughs> I have waited 30 years for this day. <laughs> now you will suffer as you have made me suffer. <laughs> oh, that's terrible, Connor. I don't know what it is. <laughs> now, I got to come home for Christmas, which is nice, because I got to see me folks again. It's nice coming home and see me folks, because I've got, uh, I've got a typical relationship with my mother in that uh, really fancier. Oh, I, oh, yeah, I want to sleep with my mouth or something first. No, I don't really, obviously. When he messing, when he joking. I can tell you by the fact that a handful of you laughed, and the rest of you shifted uncomfortably in your seats. <laughs> Then don't you feel that way about your parents either, because it's a horrible, sick, twisted notion. It's a ridiculous idea, which is, which is why I can't understand how Sigmund Freud got away with the shite he did. Honestly, for those of you who's not up on Freudian theory, right? Sigmund Freud, the inventor of psychotherapy, the godfather of modern psychology, reckons we all fancied our mothers when we were younger. I say, well, I say we all did. Obviously, just blokes. Women didn't. That'd be weird. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> According to him, we all, we, honestly, the women all fancy their dads and men all fancy their, their, their mothers when they were young. Now, I don't know about you, but my ma's a fucking boiler. Honestly. <laughs> I mean, she's a lovely woman, don't get me wrong, but oh, a weapon. Honestly. I think Freud was just a weirdo, decided we all were as well. Now, I do have a typical relationship with my mother, though, in that uh, she's an Irish mother. And that, I suppose that comes with the package where we live, doesn't it? Yeah. And being an Irish mother, though, I, I think I've noticed about her. And uh, I lived with her for quite a while, so I think I know her fairly well. No, I think I've noticed about her. She's got this funny thing that Irish mothers have of just use stock phrases all the time. You know, a little knee-jerk reaction phrase from a little phrase book in her head. Like, if I'm out on the street with my ma any time during the month of December and an ambulance goes by, 
she just has to go, oh, that's somebody's Christmas ruined. <laughs> she can't help herself. And then I start turning into me dad. I start going, oh, well, I'm sure the ambulance driver is glad of the overtime. <laughs> this time of year, just, oh, no. But in the great knack that my mother does have, and I think that mothers in general have, a great skill they've got, is they've got this great skill of being able to put things to you that you really feel you have to do whatever it is you're being told to do. But it still sounds really nice. And that's a great skill. It makes it all the more effective in order. And I think road signs should be like that. I think road signs are far too formal. They'd be much better if my ma was to just redesign them all in her own inimitable way. Like, instead of a stop sign, you'd have a sign that says, Ah, now. Hey, brilliant. <laughs> Oh, Instead of a give right of way sign, you'd have a sign that says, let the man go first. <laughs> Instead of a no parking sign, you'd have a sign that says, come on now, off you pop, come on, you're in the way, come on. <laughs> Not just road signs either, any old signs, like no smoking signs, they're very ineffective. Picture of a fag with a line through it. Nobody takes any notice of them. If you had a picture of my ma with a pack of fags in her hand and a stern look on her face, and a caption underneath that just read, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody's smoking that room. But one thing that Freud was right about, though, about your parents is that they do have a great effect on you. You know, they can say things to you that to them it's just an offhand remark, but at certain ages when you're growing up, can have a great effect on your psyche. Like I remember when I was really young, I used to love chicken. I used to eat chicken all the time. Mm -mm, chicken, 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 lovely. And my mom would say to me, oh, one of these days you're going to turn into a chicken. <laughs> If you're going to bed at night, I'd be checking for feathers, honestly. <laughs> at least that's what I told her I was doing when she walked in on me. It's a new Mud and Daz challenge. What do you think, Mum? Do you think new Daz will get it out? No, I don't. No. Normally, on white, it's mud. Too difficult. Oh, it's a shame, isn't it? What are you doing here? I like to see what's going on. Well, keep your nose out. Let's get this off and get it in, shall we? OK, the moment of truth. Here you go, Mum. Mmm. Mmm, what? No, I was just looking, because oh, usually, yes. with mud, you get, a like, a mark around the edge. Oh, I'm really impressed. I didn't think it would come out. What do you think? It's cleaner than my mum gets it. <laughs> yeah. New days, no more muddy whites. All right? <laughs> it's Kellogg's Corn Flakes 100th birthday. So to celebrate, we've put a thousand Sony Discmans in our packs, 500 mountain bikes, a hundred health farm weekends, a hundred holidays in Florida, Mazda MX-5. But best of all, one of you will win a hundred thousand pounds on your birthday. Every birthday for life! Don't miss the thousands and thousands of prizes in the Kellogg's Corn Flakes 100th birthday bonanza. More? Please? Roll it over. In the car.
Clover has an unbeatable taste because it's churned with fresh dairy ingredients, so... Bruce Willis, Armageddon. into the Irish Olympics. Ladies and gentlemen, the Irish splits. because we have so many of these fantastic little shows like this, big shows that we do so well. One of them is coming up soon, it's the Irma Awards, which you may know about. Irma are the our Irish version of the Grammys, and uh, they're on every year, and they're on this around this time, celebrating the year that's gone past. And uh, I always presumed Irma was an uh, Irish Record Music Award or something like that. Uh, but I found out actually recently, I was talking to a man who knows, apparently Irma is an old Latin verb, uh, meaning cannot be with us tonight. Uh, <laughs> I just, I just conjugate that verb. It's Madonna Irma, uh, Michael Jackson Irmo, Spice Girls Irmontanaro, uh, any international star of any repute, Irma na 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 na. The other great thing we do, of course, is uh, once a year we have that fantastic little thing, the uh, Rosa Trilli, which is on once a year, obviously enough. The, uh, and everyone, I know a lot of my friends are really cynical and they always go, no, I wouldn't watch it. The Rosa Trilli, I'd sooner eat my leg than watch the Rosa Trilli. I would sooner iron my sack than watch the Rosa Trilli. Thank you very much. It just, oh, it gets you just there, that one. Uh, the, uh, but I think, it's, I think it's ridiculous to be so negative about it because it is an opportunity to laugh at Americans and those kind of things shouldn't be overlooked. Um, and they, yeah. <laughs> The one thing the Rose Tree is very, very good for is the little performance part that they do. And it's always really, really cute. Except, of course, I don't know, is anyone here from Limerick? No. Ooh, great. Dad, can go on with all this, can't I? Is this Limerick from here on in? Um, <laughs> Limerick will find, actually, the, the Rose Tree, the Limerick Rose, is obliged by law to sing Limerick, You're My Lady every year as their part. What are you going to do? I can guess. Uh, yes, Limerick, You're My Lady. And they come out every year and they go, uh, the beauty that surrounds you, which is obviously a reference to Clare and Kerry and other counties. <laughs> uh, Bad, like that's bad to sit through that like every year the Limerick Rose, but we only see the national final. I can't imagine what it's like at the Limerick Regional Final. You know? <laughs> Just two to three hours of that shit going on. Like. So you reckon 97 is going to be a good year then for Ireland? Do you reckon we're going to finally lose the poxy Eurovision Song Contest? <laughs> I mean, that would be good, wouldn't that? Would be good. Do you realise we've won that seven times now, folks? Seven times. That's more times than any other country stupid enough to enter the feckin' thing. <laughs> when are we going to realise that the Eurovision Song Contest is, in fact, just a cruel joke the whole of Europe is playing on Ireland? <laughs> Honestly, the whole of Europe's going, we're not hosting that box of shit. Give it to Ireland again, one. They'll take it. Well done. You won again. <laughs> 
Because you can tell it's a shit thing to win, simply by the fact that we've won it seven times and nobody's ever complained. <laughs> no, nobody's ever, you never hear anybody go, oh, Ireland's getting a bit greedy with the old Eurovision there. Yeah. Nobody gives a shite. I mean, if you cast your minds back to the World Cup, right, look at something like that, 1994, when we qualified for the World Cup and England didn't, right, no big deal. We didn't even win that, we were just there, we were asked to go, so we went, and they didn't. Ah, well, so, you know. But, but I live in London, honestly, even to this day, if I mention the World Cup, it's the same remark. It's like a rehearsed answer. It's this thing of, oh yeah, oh yeah, you might have qualified, yeah, but, but, oh, if you were fucking team was English, weren't they? Yeah, yeah, where was your manager from? I, 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 I. Don't think he was Irish, mate, no. If you find he was from England, and it's a fair point, and well made, but, you never get anybody crowing like that about the Eurovision Song Contest, do you? You never hear anybody say, oh yeah, well, you might have won the Eurovision seven times, but whose language did you use, eh? <laughs> Ed Byrne was on earlier talking about the Eurovision and our record in it. And I'm just wondering, are there any sort of Central Europeans here, like Dutch people, Norwegians, anyone who's never won the Eurovision? Because I'll just, I'll just tell you why, right? I won't offend or slag you in any way. I'll just tell you why you never win the Eurovision. It's because all your songs are exactly the same, right? They're all sung in the same Eurovision language. They're all called but, right? And they all go like this. So the song that never wins the Eurovision. Could we have some fancy Eurovision lighting, please? That's fantastic, right? <clears throat> oh, God, it is too. So the song that never wins the Eurovision. <clears throat> Chantou, frage à santé, reste en vie, je vais qu'à sauver. Reste en vain, je ne vais qu'à sauver. Je ne vais qu'à sauver, je ne vais qu'à sauver. But, gajou la douja da. I think you got the idea. There was no trouble in the north. Before the Troubles. <laughs> it, it was the Troubles that caused the whole trouble. <laughs> but there's, there's no need to dig up history. We have to look to the future. We all know how the Protestants arrived in the 17th century in their spaceship and then... <laughs> they uh, overshot the runway at Aldergrove Airport and landed in a lock, so they dragged themselves out of the lock, and they consulted Ulster about what to call this lock, and Ulster said nay. <laughs> I, I think unionists would really enjoy studying Irish history. You know, if they liked the hunger strikes, they'd love the famine. one thing, if you are British and you're living here, you will eventually get the 800 years of oppression gig. <laughs> now, it can be anywhere between 200 and 800 years, depending on who you're talking to. And when I first came over, I'd get this all the time, ah, you oppressed us for 800 years. And I was so liberal, I'd go, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just started getting on me nerves. And there was one bloke who used to do this to me all the time. You've oppressed us for 800 years, until finally I snapped. I said, look, mate, I am not personally responsible for your oppression, you thick Irish potato-eating bog trotter. <laughs> and he cancelled the wedding. We had, a, we had a ceasefire in the north of Ireland for 17 months, which was fantastic, because I live in London and that's where all the fucking bombs are going off. <laughs> And it was great, you know, because you could get on the tube during the ceasefire and you could sit there and you didn't have to worry about the lone suitcase. You know, you could just sit there watching the old suitcase and thinking, ah, sure, it's just an old suitcase there. Sure, you know, somebody's just left it. Ah, sure, it doesn't matter. And you think to yourself, I might even have it if nobody, you know, I might take it with me like when I get off. But not anymore. Now you're sitting on the tube in London and you see the suitcase and you think, oh, look. <laughs> Nobody's touched that suitcase for 17 stops. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And you know, English people, are, they don't like to complain. They would never go and tell anybody. They don't want to make a fuss. They'd rather get blown up. <laughs> but 
what if I was wrong? Wouldn't it be awful? And there's a sign which says, if you see an unattended package, please go and tell somebody. Not if you've got a Northern Irish accent. <laughs> Took me ages catching up with the guard as well. <laughs> Excuse me, I got a brown bag. Pack off, you bastard! I got a brown bag here. Pack off. late 60s, I would go off for walks in the middle of the night, you know, and um, two o'clock in the morning, everybody in bed, I would sneak out the door and I went down this narrow country road one night and um, starry night, you know, very atmospheric, you know, frosty, clear sky. And uh, I ended up leaning against this gate in the middle of the night on my own countryside, looking up at the stars and uh, oh, I was really quiet. You could hear the pin drop. A bit like this, actually. <laughs> and uh, I got philosophical. And I started asking myself these uh, deep questions like, um, who am I? Why am I here? And then this British Army patrol came round the corner. <laughs> and uh, this young, fresh-faced soldier jumped out of the truck about the same age as myself, and he came over to the gate and he said to me, who are you? <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> and immediately I felt less alone. <laughs> that there was some other young soul out there just grappling with the exact same questions. <laughs> And then another half a dozen young lads jumped out of the truck and <laughs> it was wonderful. Suddenly found myself surrounded by my peers and, um, and they were really interested in me. That's what was the, the whole new thing for me. Oh, God, they wanted to know my name, my address, you know, my father's name, my mother's name, you know, my friends' names, the date of birth, you know, what I did on the long winter's evenings to pass the time. Ah, oh, it was fantastic. <laughs> and um, they were very, very worried about my lack of identity. You know, I said I didn't know who I was, and um, God, they, they, were, they were so put out about that that they invited me back to their place. <laughs> and I was going, oh, no, no, I couldn't. No, no, really, no, no, no. Come on, they said, come on. Get in the truck, for God's sake. God, I was embarrassed. You know, they, they talk about the Irish being friendly, but... Um... <laughs> no, no, he said, come on, come on, they said. God, they wouldn't hear I've taken no for an answer. They practically dragged me into the truck. <laughs> and uh, we got back to their place. Oh, it was fantastic. Oh, oh we were up all night talking. <laughs> You can see the second part of So You Think You're Irish at the same time, 12.40, next Tuesday night. in an unusual place. It's all about losing your inhibition. Ah! Ow! <laughs> you should try being more open. I am open. Reading body language. Stop the cab! You pervert! I think you should seriously consider lowering your standards. And finding a soulmate. 
From now on, my sex life is going back to exactly how it used to be. Indoors, on a bed. By yourself. Babes in the Woods, Thursday at 9 on ITV. Next tonight, songwriter turned singer Cheryl Crow talks about her music and her career on... Sing fine lines in four weeks. New retinol concentré pure from rock. We keep our promises.